what do you think kind of kickstarted your your role uh, down this journey and what motivates you? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I actually started uh, Libertarian Attack Radio, which is, is now defunct. It's uh, Liber Libertarian Attack Publications. Uh, we publish uh, actually a second round book on strategy and some, some other uh, some other agorist and, and critical anarchy sort of uh, sort of books. But uh, yeah, I started LUA Radio back in February of 2015, and uh, you know, it was very, very much at that time. Um, was not uh, into the self liberation stuff. Wasn't uh, what I would call an anarchist. Had never even heard of the term Vanuan. Uh, obviously, I hadn't come across second round stuff yet. Um, I was, uh, I guess you could say, more of a minarchist, constitutionalist here, um, you know, um, in, the, in the states, and um, I guess more in kind of the conspiratorial, conspiratorial realm. Uh, dug through a lot of uh, Bill Cooper, uh, the now now late Bill Cooper's uh, material for anyone who might be familiar with that. So that's actually where I started. It was way back, way back there, back in 2014, 2015, and uh, yeah, very soon after I started LA Radio, um, I came across some some anarchists, and I guess uh, anarchy wasn't what I'd been told it was, uh, as is uh, as is the case for most everything. And uh, I uh, it went down uh, the deep dive of Austrian economics, you know, read the, the Rothbard, the Mises, got through human action, which I'm still pretty proud of, um, and uh, got through kind of the economic stuff, went through some of the philosophy. And I got to a point, uh, you know, being in alternative media, you know, there were a lot of podcasts, a lot of you know, libertarian podcasts and radio shows and, and uh, all that. But there really was a, a major lacking of, uh, of solutions like, OK, um, obviously, free markets are good. Like that's that's the preferable preferable way. Right. Like no, no coercion. Um, and yeah, obviously the state is the biggest inflictor of that coercion. So why don't we just kind of, you know, let's, let's, let's be free now. Like, what, what are we going to do about it? And there wasn't really a whole lot of talk about it beyond agorism. Um, obviously Bitcoin was, was around at that time, but it still wasn't as big as, it was, it obviously wasn't, uh, you know, as, um, where, where, uh, where it is today. So yeah, I, uh, I, I got, uh, I I saw an opening and uh, really just took it. I think it's also a great excuse of, of being a podcaster or radio show host. <laughs> to kind of get interesting people to talk to <laughs> because yes, kind of everyone yeah. <laughs> likes to to be publicized and to be uh, well talked about uh and for you as the host it's a great way to actually talk to people and to ask questions without kind of having this weird feeling of uh, interrogating someone <laughs> because it's publicly announced mm -hmm. right yes and, and and beyond that too i mean you, you uh that that's a, an important thing too the networking um you know just have, being able to have these conversations you know reaching out to um, you know, pretty, pretty large people, I guess, pretty popular people. I wouldn't be, there'd be, there'd be no reason for us to have a conversation before. Right. Um, so yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Um, it, it, it definitely provides a, a very good excuse, um, for, you know, starting conversations with people. And it's a, it's, an, it's a good opportunity. It's open up the conversation for, for, you know, for, for the, for the public. So, um, that, that's another thing, but, but, you know, talk, uh, going back to the free public of Pasnia too. Um, I mean, the, the radio show is what well, it was the foundation for everything I'm doing now too. Um, so I, I found out about through LUA Radio, um, something called the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest in Michigan, um, in 2015 through a colleague and calling I met a colleague I met on, on the internet who started a little, I guess, organization, Liberate RVA down in Richmond, Virginia, Cal Mulna. He told me about this freedom festival that uh, you know was taking place, and I uh, you know just ended up ended up showing up there. And now um, I've got uh, um, obviously you know um, we uh, here at the Pasnia we incorporate you know private security culture principles. Um, only people who I know or who have been vetted can come out here. Um, well, my first layer of trust, essentially, the, the first people that came out here for Bonnie Fest 1 um, were essentially like, you know, the 20 or 25 people I've been going to Freedom Festivals with, um, especially the, the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest for the past five years or so. So um, as far as the, I guess that, that that's a pretty pretty significant thing, too, is yeah, the, the podcasting. Um, not only did it just provide, you know, good, you know, online networking skills, like um, an editor for Agoras Nexus now. Um, so I, I, you know, get paid Bitcoin to, um, you know, edit articles over there. Um, so that's that's pretty neat. That wouldn't have happened without the podcast and all that. So, I mean, yeah. Um, obviously the online stuff is great, but it's manifesting into physical space and time. Like we're actually building something. You here. can almost radically change your your course of action. And and you said that this happened to you, right? That you some eventually moved on from this radio type. Kind of what led you to that change? Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, really. Um, I, I wrote my book, I guess I, was, I finished my book, um, well, I guess mid-2018 to, mid or so, um, Banu, the search, uh, Banu uh, Strategy for Self-Liberation. And um, I suppose that that was about the time I was wrapping up LUA Radio. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd already been doing the Banu podcast, and most everything we talked about on LUA um, could have been worked into Banu. So I, did, I didn't see a point in continuing both of them. And LUA Publications kind of naturally, um, kind of uh, naturally started out of that. And 
um, I guess it was it was right around that time. Like there was it was just I don't know changes in the air or something. I, I just started a, a new job as a, an electrician apprenticeship or electrician apprentice, and I was uh, you know gonna do that. You know, it was good paying, best paying job I ever had was was you know trade. And uh, you know it wasn't uh, wasn't a bad job. I, I enjoyed it. You know, there's you know, lots of learning, lots of opportunity. But after about six months or so, like I just stopped going in. Like I, I just I, I wasn't feeling it anymore. I I I I, I guess I, I made a decision to move in, move to uh, Austin, Texas, uh, move in with my co-host of the Vonnie Podcast at that time, Kyler Reardon, and uh, just made a, made a quick random I guess move to Austin, Texas. Never been to Austin before. Just kind of randomly. Felt like I was called to do it. I guess that's that's the best way that I could that I can explain it. You know, looking back on it, um, but I ended up in Austin. Was there for for a couple few months, and um, they they were renting an apartment, um, and the lease was coming up um, near the end. The lease was coming up, and I had a pretty quick. I had another pretty quick change in living situation that I had to make, and it just so happened that uh, my buddy Jason Henza was coming down uh, from Chicago to uh, um, you know driving down to Acapulco, Mexico. And, uh, I, uh, he, you know, he said, you know, I can come, come right by there, pick you up. We go to Acapulco and, um, you can come stay out there as long as you want to with me. And I was like, uh, so I, 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 uh, you know, made another crazy move. Um, never been to Acapulco, um, before either, obviously never driven through there, been to Mexico a couple of times, like tourist spots for, for, you know, vacations, but never, never road trip through Mexico. So, um, yeah, I, uh, hopped in the car with him and we road trip to Acapulco. I stayed there from, um, uh, I guess November to December, um, 2018, was it 2018? Yeah. It's years all run together now, really. But yeah, it was at end of 2018, stayed there uh, until, uh, until Christmas and then came back to, I was going to come back for the holidays to see my family and, um, never, never got back to, to Mexico. But, um, yeah, I, I ended up, uh, ended up back, uh, coming back to the homestead where I am now had no plans to, to start what I, I'm, I'm start, start what I have going on here now, but um, it was just like, with, I guess, within the span of maybe like six months, um, it was a, uh, uh, it was a pretty nomadic adventure. Um, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of spontaneity. Um, no real plan or or, or vision. Was just kind of going, like going with it, and seeing seeing where where things ended up. And um, like I guess I ended up back here at the homestead. And um, couple, by that time, a couple uh, some, some some folks in my network had started this. Uh, I guess this uh, travel. Um, you know, uh, this, uh, travel job. And, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they, they stop by the property every once in a while and it kind of naturally coalesced into, um, a spot for some, for some of my nomadic people to, to stop by and camp and, and all that. And, uh, yeah, last year, uh, that, that's, I guess the, um, the, the worldwide nonsense kicked off. And, oh no, I got a little panicked. I, I eat only meat, essentially. And, um, when, uh, there were, Fears of uh, meat running out at the grocery store, which I was dependent upon then, which is not a good thing, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing now. But um, <laughs> yeah, that that fear kind of hit me, and so I went and got some lambs and some goats, and uh, here we are today. So um, yeah, it wasn't, uh, it certainly wasn't a smooth, um, a smooth, well planned, well executed, um, <laughs> you know, plan by by any means. But um, you know, I think this is kind of the way that it, that it, that it had to happen. Um, I mean, it's kind of well, it's the way that it did happen, but. Um, I don't know. Um, it wasn't, wasn't easy and, uh, you know, still figuring things out. I, I've obviously like before and I've, in, in this life, like I've, I've never done anything with like farming or livestock or anything like that. So I've, I'm just learning everything as I'm going. And, uh, you know, it's hopefully it pans out. It's going well so far. So that's kind of what I'm, what I'm banking on to continue. What, what do you think were some of the upsides as well as the downsides of that kind of erratic nomadic uh, lifestyle? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess, um, the, with, with at least the, with at least the, what I did, the, the most, I guess the, the worst thing was that I was, I was basically wholly dependent. Um, I mean, I, I could travel, um, but I, I didn't have, uh, you know, a good network of like online jobs to keep me, to keep me afloat at that time. So like, it was very, very, um, you know, very sketchy, get sketchy financially. Um, so that was, that was kind of, uh, I guess one, one kind of downside, um, that kind of, uh, the, the unknown, which the unknown is also positive too, in my opinion. So it, it kind of goes out the way. Um, but really the positive, and, and this was, um, I guess this was the part to my, my entire decompression process from the deep, the, from the Serval Society. Um, like really like a, like a, and, and I noticed this myself, but with people, when you're in a, you know, a nine to five job, um, you know, 40 hours a week forever. Um, and you're always within that survival society mindset, you know, go, 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 survive, survive, survive. Um, you know, like it's, it's very, like it's, it's, uh, um, you don't really have a lot to, a whole lot of time to think about anything else, right? So, um, that really, that was kind of the first opportunity I had. 
um because when i was i was either working and or going to high level indoctrination college um you know before that so there wasn't a whole lot of time to really think about anything to to reflect on my life growing up and, and all of that so um that was really the first time where i, I call what i i call and, and this is what rayo called it too back in the 1960s but um i live what i call now a liberated lifestyle where my time is my own I'm, i decide my schedule i decide what i do um and that started um essentially like it, it really fully started um i would say last year but that that was kind of the first opportunity i had for for a, a multiple month span um to really start going through that so so yeah, that was a major upside. A major upside that even though um it was uh, tumultuous, even though it was um you know very dicey at times, um like there was my time was my own still, and and there was a lot of value in that. There was a lot of you know even through kind of the chaos, there was that um kind of that that kind of calm, you know that that, that the freedom was. I, I could kind of feel that that little I guess that that hint of freedom. Um. So yeah, it was uh, certainly the the catalyst for a lot of things to come. And, um, yeah, I'm, th- I'm trying to think of any other up- upsides or downsides that come to mind, but not, not really. I mean, that was the biggest upside. And the other, the, the other one, which is just kind of obvious when you, when you, um, uh, if, if you're in, a, if you're in a position like I was, that's just kind of, you're, you're going to deal with, um, you know, money might be tight, but at the same time, like there's, there's, there's other benefits. But too. the, the other side to financial independence, not just on the income side, but on the expenditure side, right? If you, if you spend less, well, your savings will last you longer. And so how did you feel the the cost aspect of this nomadic lifestyle compared to others? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the the biggest portion of most people, you know, if we're talking about the survival society, the biggest portion of people's income usually goes to like a mortgage or to to rent or something along those lines. So um, if you uh, if you move into, I guess, a situation um, like, uh, for example, Rayo, the first thing at the first lifestyle he pursued was van nomadism and Max like like you. Um, he, um, he moved out and he moved out into a van, um, into a camper mounted on his pickup truck. So obviously that major, that biggest expense is gone. Um, and, uh, we did, uh, uh, an entire series on van nomadism, I guess a few years back on the Bonnie podcast. And, uh, yeah, um, from a bunch of case studies, a uh, bunch of different case studies, I mean, anywhere from like 500 to a thousand dollars a month, um, is what a lot of these people were living on. Um, and, uh, yeah, from, from my experience, um, I was staying, um, I was just, I was just camping out of my vehicle. Um, I was just, yeah, tent camping out of my Mercury Grand, Mercury Grand Marquis. Um, but, uh, yeah, I found, uh, I found a, a place to camp that was like $7 a night north of Austin, beautiful place. And, uh, um, you know, um, <clears throat> like I said, the, the unfortunate part is I was dependent upon the survival society for everything. So I had to go buy, I had to buy everything, but I mean, I didn't have much to spend. I didn't have much to spend anyway. So I was kind of, I, I had to spend what I could spend and it was, it wasn't much. So. Um, yeah, um, cutting, cutting expenses is definitely, definitely important. Um, it's, uh, um, that alone, um, that step alone, um, could be, I guess, uh, that, that, that first step for a lot of people, if they just cut their, if they just cut their expenses up to a certain amount, they might find that instead of working 40 hours a week, they can now only work 20. Mean time to harassment. Now, what is that actually? And why is it a meaningful metric to look at? Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, the meantime to harassment was, um, so really one of, one of the problems, I guess, that Rayo also foresaw is that there's a lot of, a lot of strategies where it's impossible, where it's nearly impossible to gauge the efficacy of a strategy. So like political crusading, for example, like we know it doesn't work, but like if you actually try to like actually try to put it out statistically, like it's very, very hard to actually quantify the success rate of someone running for office. Um, or for, for a lot of, for a lot of strategies, it's hard to quantify those things. So Rayo actually came up with this, this concept of mean time to harassment. And basically, it's a way to gauge the um, the efficacy of of a of a Bonnie lifestyle. So, um, for example, um, it would measure the amount of time between um, instances of coercion. So, for example, a van nomad who might have uh, um, a van nomad might have more interactions um, or have a a lower mean time to harassment than um, someone who uh, practiced wilderness fauna in the middle of the woods. Um, they would have more interactions with the survival society. They have more interactions with coercers in general. So that's the idea. Is it's just a way to gauge the efficacy of a Vani, a Vani lifestyle, um, and it's in terms of how often um, you interact with um, with the state, with, uh, with with the state, or with private coercers. Is is the idea? Yeah, right. And I like that aspect too. That it's it's not just the state, who's who's of course a big attacker, but private individuals are assholes as well. Right? So, uh, like mm-hmm. just you know, getting beaten over by thugs or your your purse stolen uh, is uh, is you know harassment already. And uh, just by including this statistic, 
as well as any interaction with the state, right? Like requiring a license plate or paying property taxes and all these, all these things where that are not based on a voluntary ethical uh, action can be nicely quantified. And then, as you said, right, compared across strategies and we can kind of get a su success metric out of this. Right. And, and I'll also mention one other element that he puts, uh, and, and Vani book one, again, vanipodcast.com. Just go to that free books tab if you want to pull up this chart. Um, it's in Vani book one, the search for personal freedom. But, uh, there's a chart in there too. And the other element that he puts on there is, is, is activity. So, um, if you are a pedestrian, you know, traveling through the wilderness where there's nobody out there, the activity is going to be very, very low. Um, whereas if you are starting, you know, like small manufacturing facility, the activity is going to be a lot higher. So that's another element too is, um, another element to meantime to harassment is, is also gauging, you know, like your, your own efficacy and your own, um, your own, I guess, uh, possibilities, um, with, with your skills. Um, so someone who is not very proficient at, um, I don't know, security culture principles or not very proficient at, um, you know, practicing the grand man or something along those lines, they might not be the best person to like start an intentional community or something like that, right? Um, they might be best, uh, you know, getting a van and going and learning these things and trying it out and, you know, a, much, a more safer route, I guess you could say, one that would draw less attention, um, where they can, you know, kind of blend in and just kind of, um, learn these things in a, in a safe, a, a more, you know, safe and conducive environment. Um, so yeah, that's another, another element too when we're talking about Bonnie lifestyle changes is the activity or the proficiency, um, that one would need to have. Um, and again, to go back to this example, um, you know, starting intentional community, which involves, you know, dispute resolution and all sorts of complex stuff versus some driving a car around, which we're taught to do when we're 16, you know, by the state. So if the state can teach us to drive, um, you know, via their, you know, their dumb DMVs and shit, then it's probably a pretty easy thing to do. Right. So, um, yes, we're talking about proficiency levels here uh, as well. <laughs> 